Time having arrived, I'm going to call the Finance Committee meeting for Tuesday, February 21st, 2017, to order. Uh, before we go into the agenda, um, our fine, esteemed city clerk, Anthony Zioli, actually had two losses in his family. Uh, two sisters passed away. Oh, wow. um, Angelina Donnie, who was buried today, and he, he lost another sister yesterday. So if we could uh, please remember the Zioli family and, of course, wow. Tiffany Botello, who works in uh, Mr. Conan's office. Uh, her grandmother was buried today. So if we could please take a moment of silence. Our thoughts and prayers are with their families. That being said, uh, Madam Clerk, uh, oh, <coughs> one other housekeeping. Uh, Mayor Carpenter emailed me. Uh, he actually is unable to attend this evening. So when we get to agenda uh, seven, which I believe is Council Beauregard's resolve, I'm going to ask you to uh, make a motion to postpone that. He did say he's ready, willing, and able to attend uh, and speak on that issue, Council, so we can get to that. Uh, okay. Agenda item number one, please. Appointment. Kelly Maleri of Brockton, Mass., to the Brockton Parking Authority for a five-year term ending January 31st, 2022. Invited Kelly Malori. Good evening. Hi. How are you? Good evening. How are you? Good, thanks. Thanks for being here. Do you have a statement for the Finance Committee at all or anything to say? No, I actually just got the file and I'm going to read through it. And I did speak a lot to various people, so I don't really have anything. Okay. Councilors, any questions? Motion to recommend favorably. Second. On the motion, Councilor? Yeah. Councilor just file while you're recognized. Just on the motion, Mrs. Mallory, what I'm going to say to you applies to uh, uh, Attorney Boone and Attorney Williams. Uh, cities and towns are very heavily dependent upon people who are willing to step forward and volunteer their time and talent. So I don't like to see people routinely come in and out of here because we really are appreciative of taking time away from your family and your business. And you'll be uh, working with Mr. Uh, Malley, who is uh, he, he's an exceptional person. I'm going to embarrass him tonight and tell him that uh, I found out the other day through my reliable informants he had perfect scores on his SAT. So. <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. So, seriously, you will you will thoroughly enjoy the work, and uh, and I really appreciate the fact that you're you so giving much. of your time to the city. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Any other questions, Council? Point of information. I think they meant he had an 800 total on his SAT. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll note that in the record, Councilor. Duly noted. There's a motion on the floor. Favorable recommendation back to full Council is properly second. All in favor? All opposed. Motion carries. Favorable recommendation back to full Council. Agenda item number two, please. Appointment of Conroy Boone of Brockton, Mass., to the Brockton Parking Authority for a five-year term ending January 31st, 2022. Invited Conroy Boone. Good evening, Mr. Good how evening. are you? Good. How are you? Good, thank you. Do you have a statement? I don't. Just a Brockton guy looking to serve and give back to the um, community of Brockton. So. Excellent. We appreciate that. Any questions? Make a motion to recommend favorably. Second. second. Motion made properly. Second. Favorable recommendation back to full council. All in favor? All opposed. Our motion carries. It's favorable recommendation back to full council. Thank you. Thank you. Number three, please. Appointment Donald Williams of Brockton, Mass. to the Brockton Cable Advisory Board for a three-year term ending on January 31st, 2020. Invited Donald Williams. Good evening, Attorney Williams. How are you? Good evening. How are you? For the record, 1342 Belmont Street, your law office. That's what's the law your, What's your residence? 151 Rockland Drive, Brockton. Thank you, sir. If, clerk, if we could put that into the minutes. Any questions for Attorney Williams? Council Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Mr. Williams, uh, welcome, and thank you for... Um, volunteering Thank to you. serve your city. Um, uh, just a quick question. Uh, are you familiar at all with cable contracts? Do you have any experience in dealing with cable contracts? Not particularly with cable contracts at all. Uh, because as you know, the, um, the city's contract with Comcast uh, will expire in a couple of years. Right. I, I, I believe in about a year, year and a half or so. Yeah. And the city will have to renegotiate that contract again. That's why I was asking. Yes. No, I haven't seen anything yet as of yet. And, and, and also, um, um, as soon as you're confirmed, in a sense, by the uh, by the body here, <clears throat> I hope that you light some sort of a fire under that uh, that um, group, in a sense, because they haven't met since I was in the Harrington administration, some close to eight years ago. So uh, you'll be a welcome uh, site, and hopefully they will do what they need to do to move forward. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And if there's any uh, any additional questions, I'd like to make a motion to move a favor. Any questions? Second. Motion made. Council, was a motion? Favorable recommendation? Yes, sir. It was properly seconded by Council Azak. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Favorable recommendation back to full council. Thank, Thank you, you very Attorney much. Williams. Have a good evening. Agenda item number four, please. 
Order that the City Council authorize the acceptance and expenditure of the total grant in the amount of $100,000 from the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, Massachusetts Municipal Public Safety Staffing Grant Program to the Brock City of Brockton Police Department, Massachusetts Municipal Public Safety Staffing Grant Fund. These funds are being provided in the form of overtime funds for the Brockton Police to use for patrol shift replacement, detective investigations, etc. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Chief John Crowley, Brockton Police Department. Good evening, Chief. How are you? Good evening. I'm well, thank you. Yourself. Thanks for being here tonight. You're welcome. Do you have any statements or anything? Um, it's just exactly what uh, she announced. The expenses are be used for detective investigations, warrant sweeps, and be used towards minimum patrol staffing. It's a thank grant you. we've received over the last um, four or five years. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Any questions? Council Cruz. Uh, Chief, thanks for being here. Is this less than we used to get in this grant? Um, it's significantly less. When we first got it, we got the amount of $600,000. Um, the next year was reduced to three hundred ninety-five. dollars Last year, we were fortunate enough to receive 350000 This year, we took a uh, $250,000 cut in that, and it's 100000 And we don't see any way to replace that, correct? Not from that source, no. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Council Bonds. Uh, I just have a question, I think, for Mr. Condon. Is this one of those um, non-matching? Yes, no okay. match. So we have we we don't need to uh, do anything really. We just have to accept it and then just accept it and spend then spend it the way that it was. gets to spend the money, but there's no match. Okay, so with this grant, actually, to, to follow up on uh, what Councillor Cruz just said, so is there a reason for the reduction in the amount and such a drastic reduction? It's just not available, or well, I think the state cut the program, uh, but I don't know that we know for sure why it was that our cut seemed to be so large and other communities weren't hit in the same fashion, other gateway communities. We simply didn't get the funding. Oh, okay. It's discretionary at the uh, State Office of Public Safety, and we just didn't get it. Is this something that we can maybe look into so that, you know, if there's something we didn't do? Or yeah, it's, can... it's, a, it's a competitive application, I, and then at that point it becomes a discretion of the state as to how much they want to distribute, and we, you know, we've applied as we have every year, and this year we didn't get as much. Hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I need to ask uh, the chief a question. Uh, I guess in the same lines uh, with the question that uh, Council Cruz asked, I mean, what are we doing wrong in terms of not going after additional funding? I mean, everybody knows that um, a report came out not too long ago naming Brockton one of the more, uh, I think, one of the top 100 more violent cities in the, uh, in, the, in the country, in a sense. And we've got all the ammunition, in the sense, that we, ha that we need to go after some funding to help us in all um, processes that we're dealing with. So what, what are we doing wrong? It's a good question. Um, this particular grant, only 10 communities were eligible for it. We asked for $500,000 for the police department, um, and whoever reviews it at the state level chose to give us $100,000. Um, I don't have an answer. Uh, I, I'm also, uh, I was also told that the uh, city of Newton, for instance, were they one of the recipients of this grant? Do you know? In passing? In passing, they have. Um, I just have the stats for 2017 for similar sized cities as Brockton. Um, yeah, some, somebody told me that the city of Newton actually applied for a grant similar to this. They were they, one of the eligible communities and, and they, they did got, receive funds. They got almost $600,000. And, and yet, when you sit down and think about it, uh, the issues that Newton has is not the issues that Brockton has. And how do we, I mean, what do we need to do to, to, to convey to the, to, the, uh, to the stakeholders at the Commonwealth level? to understand that there's actually a need and a need to, to, to put some real resources behind the city because, uh, I mean, I see some of the things that we're getting from the state, from the state level that resembles what little towns get. Because if uh, a city of Newton, with the resources that Newton has, you know, applies for a grant and gets $600,000 and the city applies for the same grant, we only get $100,000. It, it's almost like, I mean, you're comparing, you know, situations where you know, it's Brockton versus Avon type of thing, you know? So what do we need to do? How do we get our masses involved and resources involved to actually go up there and make some, whatever, whatever noise we need to make to, to bring some more additional resources into this community? Um, I would say we need to lobby our state legislature body. Um, Newton did get the grant. I'm not sure if they got that amount, but they did get money. Yeah, but it's another grant, another police grant that somehow that we got around a hundred and something thousand dollars and they got around $600,000. That's what somebody told me. You know, and it's, it's kind of embarrassing where, 
you know, we get beat, you know, beat up pretty well because, you know, you, are, you live in one of the uh, 100 most dangerous cities in America, but yet somehow it doesn't get treated as such in terms of resources that we need to somehow um, uh, decrease uh, that ranking that we're getting, you know. And is there any way that the next time that these grants do become available that we, for instance, get informed of this ahead of time so we can do some lobbying and do something that we need to do from our own levels in the sense to try to help the city uh, improve its stance? Yes, next year during the application period, I'll reach out to the council and let you all know that we're in the process of applying. Yeah, because it's somewhat embarrassing and it's not, and it's not I'm not saying that it's your fault or the, the department's fault, but it just, it, it sells you a little short in the sense, you know, when you have an opportunity to do, uh, do something, because there's some communities doing real well with grants. You I know, agree. For some odd reason, the city somehow gets shortchanged when it comes to that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council. Councilor Yaniri. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Chief. How are you? Good, thank you. Just to, um, just to come on the uh, heels of my um, colleague there at large, uh, Rodriguez, uh, because I think he does raise a, a very good point. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I wouldn't do anything to want to hold this up uh, this evening, naturally, but can you do us some type of a survey and, and just see what other communities are doing, getting? I mean, could you do something and just get back to us uh, within like 30 days, just so we can see? Yes. I'm sure it's a, a standard application that went through, and whoever reviews it at the state level, they decided where the dollars were going to go. Right, I understand that part, but in the finalization, is Newton, is he, is, is he right in saying what Newton's receiving? I, I mean, I don't um, believe that that figure is accurate. The highest one that I have heard was, um, was uh, Lawrence received 825,000, Fall River received 480,000, Lowell 106, and Lynn 489,000. Um, but I just recorded cities that were similar to Brockton. Yeah. Yeah, and but still, still I look at I look at Brockton as somewhat. I know when you when some of those you listed. I mean, yeah, they they're urban cities as well. So if that's the case, then all urban cities should receive about five hundred thousand dollars. Stop. You know what I mean? I am in complete agreement with that. that. That I mean, if we've got a call, I agree with you. Then we have to talk to our state people and and say this is what we're looking at and this is what we want back. So I, I think you're right. So maybe when the next process, you know, begins, let us know and see yes. what we can do to help you because. Um, uh, that's the only fair way. At least 400,000. Let's all be even. You know what I mean? Let's all be even. Uh, I mean, Lawrence doesn't have the problems that we have, and look, at they're, they're even getting more. That's, that's, that's not good, but uh, that's not your fault. You know what I mean? But I think we can do something as well. I think we need to do that. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor, any other questions for the Chief? Councilor Cruz, follow-up? Uh, yeah, just a quick comment. I, I think as you look at uh, some of those numbers dropping uh, some years ago, but the huge drop coincides with the governor's office that uh, really has turned its back on the uh, gateway cities and the, mm -hmm. the total amount of this grant is down quite a bit from what has been given out before and again I believe it's a policy of this governor's office uh, that uh, he has turned his back on the gateway cities and uh, again that's where we are there's a smaller pool of money for for those of us that he does not consider important so thank you and with that I make a recommendation to rec uh, move to recommend favorably second Motion made, properly seconded, favorable recommendation back to full council. All in favor? All opposed, our motion carries. Favorable recommendation back to full council. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Agenda item number five, please. Order, the mayor is hereby authorized to grant an easement to Manuel Bujinja Jr. as owner of plot 30, 30-1, and 31 Leach Avenue, his successors and assigns for purposes of maintaining a water main water line over land of the city known as plot 11 Warren Ave. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, Larry Rowley, Commissioner, Department of Public Works, Manuel Bujinja, Jr. Good evening, Mr. Commissioner. Good evening. Good evening, Councilors. Um, I don't have any objections to this um, easement. I think it's going to be good for the city, um, for that particular area where it's going to go. So I have no objections to this tie-in for the water. Councilor Yanari, this is your thank, ward. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and members of the uh, Council, this is... Uh, in my ward, and as you know, um, we're in the process right now of doing a project right near South Middle School, which is going to consist of uh, three homes. We're, we're taking that particular area from making it commercial, industrial, making it more residential, extension of Leach Avenue to a certain point. 
uh, not a completion of Leach Avenue. So that's what this is for, as the DPW commissioner had mentioned. And I, I think that we have to more or less have it in order for us to move forward, for him to move forward, to get to the next step with, with planning. We've already uh, been through zoning and that's all approved. It's just this piece here and um, and, and he's right. I think it's, it's good for the city. It'll be a positive. So I, I move for a favorable recommendation. Second. Motion made, properly second, a favorable recommendation back to the full council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. Favorable recommendation back to the full council. Thank you, Mr. Raleigh. Thank you, council. Good night. We're gonna go on to agenda uh, number six, please. Resolve, the chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals and such other persons as he may deem appropriate be invited to appear before a committee of the city council to discuss the caseload of the board, the zoning ordinances, and any recommendations which will contribute to the protection of neighborhoods and business districts, as well as enhance economic development opportunities for the city. Invited Kenneth Galligan and or designate chairman Zoning Board of Appeals. Chief Galligan, good evening. Actually, chairman, you're in that capacity today. <laughs> Thanks for being here today. Uh, do you have any uh, any statements about this or? No, I'll just try to answer any questions that you may have. Council, who's resolved? Yours, Mr. Fowler? Yeah. yeah. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and Chief. Uh, Good evening, Council. In some conversations you and I had, you kind of invited yourself into this forum tonight because I, I was Sorry in, about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it'll be painless now. Come on. Uh, I was struck by the fact that you said oftentimes there are applicants coming before the ZBA, and it's because there is conflicting language in, in some of our zoning ordinances, if I, if I heard you properly. And I don't think we're going to get through that tonight. As a matter of fact, I probably would want to see this favorably go back to uh, the council and then maybe have you come in and talk to the ordinance committee and maybe the ZBA would work up some recommendations. But, but is that true? Is there a need, do you think, in your professional judgment to as a body take a look at those zoning ordinances and try to eliminate conflicting language or or eliminate some of the issues that require the board uh, to meet that we could clean them up a little bit I do and if you look at the zoning ordinance that we're operating under now uh, that was last put together in 1967 oh my God. there's been a number of changes that have taken place to those various sections of that ordinance and sometimes changes are made in the zoning ordinance uh, based upon what actually happens in various sections of the city. And sometimes a new re revised ordinance is put together by the council, which is your purview to do that. And it becomes conflicting with something that is in the book from back in 1967. Mm -hmm. So there are areas in the book, true, where uh, there is conflict. Uh, we have worked through that. Uh, I, I will say that uh, in all the time that I've been on the board, I think the zoning board is a very user-friendly board to people that come before us. Uh, quite frankly, most of the people that are coming before us requesting variances are here before us simply because what they are proposing to do does not fit the actual ordinance uh, pertaining to what they want to do. So they have the avenue of uh, asking for a variance. And a variance is a high bar, and I think we kind of hold everybody that comes to us to that high bar. I think the board does a good job in researching all the information, and many of the variances that we grant uh, really are necessary simply because uh, things that were put together in 1967 are different than they are in 2017. I, uh, now I am made aware uh, that there is, I believe, a committee or a group that's working on revising the ordinances. Uh, it's a lengthy operation to do that. And when you think of all the ordinances that are in that book, they're all put in there for a specific reason. And when they are reviewed, there will be a number of areas that really should be looked at to see if they should be rewritten to conform to what the city has evolved into in 2017 as opposed to what it was in 1967. The one thing that I would like to see done with a committee that looks at these and reviews these is to perhaps do something different with a book. This is the book that we operate with right here. And this one is 
uh, uh, 2007. And the form of this book being a ring binder is such that when the city council makes amendments to zoning ordinances, it's very difficult to take the revised or new ordinance and insert it into a book where perhaps a new member might not have access to the revised ordinance, but they have access to what's in this book. So I think to make things easier for both the board and for people that are coming before the board, that if we had a eight and a half by 11 type book, we're such that when you make a change in an ordinance, when it gets to zoning, we can insert that in the book. And now we all have timely current information as to what the city council has done with the zoning. I know we had mentioned a while back about the volume of cases that are coming before the board. Uh, I guess that's good and bad. It's, uh, it shows that there's a lot of interest in the city. There's a lot of people that are looking to do development within the city. Uh, some of the areas of the city, as I said, have changed. Um, we have industrial area, we have commercial area, we have residential area, and we have areas in the city where one bumps up against the other, mm -hmm. and sometimes it can become cumbersome. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that when the zoning ordinances are rewritten, there are certain areas uh, that could be adjusted to what has evolved over the years. We try not to uh, create spot zoning in the city, uh, but qu quite frankly, zoning really uh, is a roadmap of how you want the city to look. And the board uh, realizes that you people as counselors are the ones who are the elected officials who are determining where this city is going to go and what things should be in certain areas. Our job is more adjudicary that when somebody comes in and has a unique situation, they have an opportunity to look to us to see if their unique situation might fit in a particular area. So we have gone, I, I remember one night we were here till three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> we started at seven and we finished at three, believe it or not. And after that, we kind of passed a resolution among the board that we would not start a case after 11 o'clock at night. Uh, that was several years ago when sometimes we had 15 or 20 cases a night. Uh, lately, it's been probably 8 to 10 cases, which is pretty manageable. So again, I guess that was a long answer to a short question that, yes, uh, I think the, there are areas in the zoning book that need to be addressed, and I think it needs to be done with a committee. Uh, it won't be done overnight, but I think it's always good to take a look at what we have to see if it can be improved. Do you think it would be helpful if, when we have proposed zoning ordinances or amendments, that we, as a matter of professional courtesy, at least share them with you and, and you with the board for input back? Because frankly, I, and I do try to read everything that comes across our desk, but some of these zoning ordinances, I'm scratching my head saying, okay, how does this really benefit the city, other than the fact we're changing some language? So I guess I would ask, Providing some technical advice, do you think that would be helpful? Is that a role that the ZBA might provide because you handle so many of these zoning cases? Well, I, I would say that I would certainly be available for inquiry. Um, the final decision is yours. Obviously, it isn't the board's decision. I think whenever you have input, not only from elected officials, uh, board members, uh, developers, uh, ordinary citizens in the city, uh, I think you're going to get a good cross-section of who is interested in how the city develops. But uh, somebody in years gone by put a lot of work into this book. Uh, but it's been a number of years since we have had a good, up-to-date book that all of us can operate on the same page from. If, if you think now, if, if a new member came into the board, and this was the book that was given to them, we would have to go through almost page by page to see 
what has been amended and what hasn't. So I think working on getting a new book is important. And before that new book is put together, there should be a good look at what's there to make sure there's no conflict. All right, switching to your, your uh, prior life for a minute, do you believe that there are some perhaps fire prevention uh, <coughs> ordinance changes that should be incorporated into zoning? Because obviously firefighting techniques have changed. Um, if we're gonna have increased the density of residential uh, areas in the city, it would seem to me that fire prevention, fire suppression systems would be important, but is having dealt with so many zoning cases, is that an area where we, where you and Chief Williams and others might want to uh, offer some input? I'll defer it to Chief Williams. <laughs> okay, fair that, enough. But uh, actually when you think about it, if, if we try to put too many uh, fire codes in this book, from your past experience, you know that fire codes change. And sometimes the best verbiage to put in here is something will be done in conformance with the current fire codes relative to that issue. That makes it easy for verbiage in the book so that the verbiage doesn't say you have to have sprinklers where the fire code may say you don't have to have sprinklers. Uh, one of the reasons of having zoning and to have the different zones in the city is to create space for fire. Like in your residential areas where we require 175 foot frontage, uh, we require 100 foot frontage. The reason for that is to, one of the reasons is to spread buildings out so that we don't have a conflagration or fire hazard. Uh, in the downtown area, it's a little different because you have more density, but you have different building construction. You have brick construction, you have firewalls, you have sprinklers. These are things that normally you don't have in residential. Uh, personally, I think every new house that's built should have residential sprinklers. Uh, most people that die in a fire usually don't die in a place of assembly. They die in their own home. Mm -hmm. And residential sprinklers make sense, but it, it's very difficult to sometimes convince lawmakers that that should happen. So if we try to put fire codes into the zoning, we may be getting into an area where we're gonna create more problems with zoning. The, the, the basis of the zoning is to create space so that if a house catches fire, there's a pretty good probability that the house next door won't catch fire, particularly in the outskirts of the city. In the downtown area where you have multifamilies you have residential over commercial. The fire codes require sprinklers in buildings, doors that close, firewalls, all the things that you wouldn't find in residential areas. Well, the reason I ask that is that there was a, a project on uh, Pleasant Street in uh, Councilor Monahan's ward. And when it first came in, you were able to dissect some of the components of that project and point out issues like lighting in a corridor being able to vent in case the, the corridor filled with smoke. Um, I think there was something with respect to the rear of the building and you know, being able to evacuate people. And, and I was struck by the fact that that, that kind of technical, uh, those types of technical provisions maybe ought to be standard, that, that we always should have lighting in a, in a corridor in a residential building if it's being built. And so I, I don't expect an answer tonight, but because you were able to so forcefully guide that applicant to, uh, to actually a better project, which has now been approved, I, I thought that was in the best interest of not only the people who will live in that building, but the city. So, um, let, I will let me tell you that I did take my past experience, and I put my old fire chief's hat on that night, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I saw several things on those plans that firewise I thought could be done better, and that's why that happened. Well, again, I don't think we're going to solve everything tonight. My last question is a broad general one. Um, have there been instances where the ZBA has attached conditions to a variance or a special permit, and unfortunately the applicant has just gone ahead and done whatever they want? So I guess what I'm saying in a roundabout way is zoning enforcement obviously has to be a priority. Otherwise, whatever stipulations you issue, are, are quite meaningless. So has that happened and 
Would you be an advocate for us to hopefully push towards more fair and equitable but, but uh, consistent zoning enforcement? Well, as I said before when I first came up here, most of the people that come before us are looking for a variance where what they want to do doesn't quite fit. And in many instances, with some stipulations, what they are proposing to do will fit in the area that they want to go into. Quite frankly, you got to realize that everybody that comes before the board with a variance already is behind the eight ball because what they're looking for doesn't fit. If we voted no on every variance, it would pretty much shut down the development of the city. So combined with updating this book and putting stipulations on variances, we can be a user-friendly board that can encourage development in the city in a way that the zoning was laid out to make the roadmap go in the right way. Earlier I said I think some of these things need to be adjusted to make it easier. Some of these that were adjusted probably wouldn't require somebody to come before zoning. However, when we attach stipulations to something, we expect that because of what we're going to approve, with these stipulations, what you're looking for will fit. It will be in harmony with what's in the neighborhood. It will not be in violation of what's in this book. And if the petitioner goes ahead with the project and doesn't carry out the stipulations that made the project workable, then the granting of the variance becomes meaningless. Um, I have been very successful with the building department. We work very well together. Uh, Jimmy Caseri does a good job working with the Zoning Board of Appeals. And if we see any violations out there, I know when I have reported them, they're taken care of. But there are times when several months or a year or more goes by and we may put a stipulation that the green space on a particular property shall not be reduced and we go back and find that it has been reduced. So now that needs to get reported and action has to be taken. With the workload of the building department, it, it sometimes can be difficult to arbitrarily go out and look at a case that we granted a year or two ago to see if it's still in conformance with what we granted. So I guess it's, I know I, I kind of take a look at what's out there, what we grant, and I'll, I'll tell you that what I have found when I report it is taken care of. If there was somebody who was overseeing uh, stipulations on variances or just kind of back checking on what has been granted, through the zoning board in maybe the last year or 24 months, uh, I think it would send a message that if you are going to get a variance with a stipulation, then you have to live up to that stipulation. So mm -hmm. how that would work, I don't know. But I think in most cases that I have seen that when we grant a variance with stipulations, usually those stipulations are adhered to. And I personally have reported several of them that have been taken care of. So I would think that the petitioners that are coming before us know that if you don't play by the rules, uh, at some point you're going to get caught. All right. I, I, I'm going to conclude and just say to my colleagues that uh, the ZBA does do an exceptional job in terms of hearing the different applications and rendering uh, what I think are, are very good decisions to enhance the quality of life in the city. And it's one of the reasons why you will hear me in the future not embrace these smart growth districts that you drop down and give developers as a matter of right the opportunity to come in and build because I think the level of review by a group of citizens that volunteer their time, who are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by us, has proven to be an exceptional way to control growth and as the chief or the chairman said, bring the standards up. Even though the ordinances may have been written in 1967, 
bring the standards up to 2017 and enhance development in the city. So I thank you for what the board does. Uh, I think we'll have to, this is probably a year long process to go through those ordinances and do what needs to be done. But I really think the city does move, does need to move ahead from 1967 and, and get into the new century here with zoning ordinances, uh, particularly where we want to see the city grow. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Point of information, Councilor, um, I sat, uh, Mr. Monaghan was the chair of ordinance last year. And I sat on that. And Rob May, and actually the former mayor, Wainwright, has, has and I spent two hours in, in Wainwright's office over in Easton. It's, it's been worked on. Uh, I was actually charged with Council Azak right before Christmas to sit uh, with the different parties, including our legislative council. There are some changes, absolutely, that conflict that need to be modified, brought up to speed. Uh, it, is, it is a long-term process, but it already started last year on the Monahanis chair, and now Mr. Cruz's chair ordinance now. So there is, there is a process. As the chair now, uh, I, I would expect that, that the chairman of the ordinance will designate someone else with Council Azak to work on that, um, but there's definitely, it is in motion. I know that. My question to you, and then I'm going to recognize Council Bonds. Mr. Chairman, in terms of training, like when I got on planning board, there was no training, you just, you just learned. Is there specific training to people that are appointed to the ZBA because you have to learn Master and Law and the criteria for hardship and Brockton ordinances? Is there any type of training currently for new members that are appointed? Yes, there is. And the building department contracts with a company that does that type of training all over Massachusetts. Okay. And they hold different training sessions in different locations. Uh, I've been to numerous ones as members of the board. Uh, one thing I am going to suggest is that on a local level that we do some close training here with the building department, uh, planning, law department, and zoning. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a lot of issues that we kind of look at on a state level when we go to these classes on zoning and, and planning, but there are a lot of local issues. Mm -hmm. And to your answer, yeah, there is training. Uh, I, I think we could... Uh, suggest something to do something a little bit more on a local level. I'm going to propose to do that. So Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Council Bonds. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, um, Chief, I just want to follow up on something that you said. So uh, you mentioned something about, um, you know, for instance, if somebody agreed to adhere to whatever variance um, stipulations that you all put on a project and then you go back out and you know you see that, that they're in violation, you report it, and then you know they are, the consequences are, are given to them. What are those consequences? How does that happen? So if, if I'm building something, um, besides, you know, maybe having my project shut down, what other kind of consequences can people, um, or would they get for just blatantly violating, um, you know, the stipulation? Well, if it involves building, the building department could as, as can put a stop work order mm -hmm. and immediately cease all work on the structure. Uh, there is also a provision in the book where there is a fine for $100 a day so I guess once you officially get notified that you're in violation, if you don't rectify that, there is provisions for a fine. Do you think the fine should be increased? I don't know. I, I think that would be up to this board that's going to be looking at everything. Mm, okay. Um, there was something else I was actually going to follow up. You said something, but I'll, I'll let it pass. Thank, thank you, Chief. You, thank you. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief, for being here, and thank you for the job you do uh, at zoning. And I know, probably due to the economy, we haven't had the 3 o'clock in the morning meetings. Things have gotten busier again, but uh, not like the old days. And I know that Councilor Brophy had, been, uh, had pushed a resolution through that you couldn't start anything after, I believe, midnight. And then you even yeah. pushed it up to 11. 11 yeah. But uh, I think uh, the, a lot of the things that uh, Councilor Fowell is talking about uh, are, are accurate, and I think some of that is in motion. Uh, a lot of what he talked about is actually enforcement of the building codes. I mean, some of the things that come up at the meetings are actually enforcement of building codes that shouldn't have to be stipulated, but quite often you you put them in as a stipulation to help protect the neighbor, neighborhoods. One of my questions is, as all of us come to the meetings uh, that when we have an issue in uh, would you see any value in somehow, well, let me go back. You talked about some cooperation in the law department, the building department, the zoning board. I think a lot of times what ends up at the, on the zoning board agenda is, I don't want to say passing the buck, but it's let's get it there, 
because there's a, a hesitancy to make a ruling at other steps in the process. And I think there are some things that end up at zoning that there's no need to. Um, the other part about when we come to a meeting, it's amazing how you can go from you people looking at a you know 150 unit apartment uh, complex and what might happen there, and somebody that wants to build a shed three feet off of their line and they're looking for a, a and to me, it's the, the nights I sit here and I feel, I mean, there are nights I sit here and feel bad for our council, but there are nights I've sat at zoning meetings and say, my goodness, how are these people supposed to, you, you have people who are, again, they had to argue about whether their neighbor should be able to build a garage, which is not a major problem in the city, but they spend all night there while you're also discussing something that can be a million dollar tax benefit to the city. Should there be some way to separate the, the type of meeting you have so that we are not wasting the time of, of yourselves, of the neighbors, of the developers? I think the only people who love the setup right now are the lawyers who do, uh, who do zoning work. And uh, there are some that are doing very well, and I don't blame, I don't begrudge them, but it's, uh, uh, they get here for a 7 o'clock meeting, they might not be up till 11 o'clock at night. It's, uh, it's a nice billable night for them. Do you, do you see any, any plus in somehow taking out those minor issues and not having them come before the, the entire board? Well, when you think about it, somebody that makes a decision when a building permit is going to be issued for a location, if that permit is not allowed because what they want to do is too close to the property line, then they have to deny the permit. Right. The option is for that petitioner to come before the board to seek relief. The million-dollar apartment complex gets as much attention as the guy that's got a garage that's three feet too close to the property line. And if you're the next door neighbor who has to put up with that garage, to you, that's much more important than the million dollars. It is, dollar. and that's, what, that's usually when we're here. It is, and you know, quite frankly, uh, I don't mind doing that. And one thing our board does, and I gotta give credit to the board, that you've got five people that sit there that are not compensated for what they are doing. We are all giving our time to the city. I've been there for 23 years on the board, and I go out and I look at every site. And I find that if I look at the site and then come in and hear the petitioner, I can usually follow along in my mind exactly what they're talking about. So that doesn't bother me. Or oftentimes me. I've heard you catch them, not just follow along. Well, sometimes what I'm told isn't what I actually saw. I love those nights. I do too. <laughs> and, uh, I shouldn't say that, but quite frankly, I think it sends a message out to the petitioner that if you're coming before the board and you're looking for relief, the board should be pretty well versed on what you're looking for before you even start your presentation. Mm -hmm. And again, everybody has the right to come before the board, right. and I think if you listen to how I run the meeting, I usually let everyone say what they have to say, and then we will make our decision. And we make our decisions based upon what's good for the neighborhood, what's good for the city, and how it follows in line with the zoning ordinance. So whether somebody makes a decision or doesn't make a decision and it ends up before our board, that's why we're there. We don't know so much about what's happened on how it got to us. All we know that this case is before us, there's a problem with it, and that petitioner is asking for relief and they're trying to convince us that their, their situation is unique to them. And quite frankly, if, if it's unique to them and it works and it fits in the neighborhood, usually they'll do okay. But we do deny a number of them. And oh, I know. Yeah. If, if somebody gets denied by one person's decision mm -hmm. and they come before a board of five disinterested persons and those five people concur that it shouldn't happen, then I think that's a pretty solid decision. And honestly, I gotta give the board credit. They're, they're, a, they're a good bunch of people. Uh, they put a lot of time into it. We, we, we put a lot into our discussions. And quite frankly, uh, the building inspector works hand in hand with us. I work almost on a daily basis with him talking back and forth. And we get along fine. And I usually understand what every case is before somebody even opens up their mouth to talk about it. So if you don't do that, and that requires a lot of time also that most right. people don't realize, that if you don't do that, the night of the hearing, uh, 
it can make it difficult to determine what's right and what isn't. So it, it's, it's a lot of work, but I think the board is important for the city. And if, if one individual has made a decision and the petitioner doesn't like it, they should have the opportunity for five people to make a decision. And that's what it's all about. How often do we get sued, the board? Not very often. Not too often? No. Actually, when I write my decisions, I write them as if uh, they were going to be questioned. And I try to be as fair as I can and relate to law when I write it. So, you know, everybody has the opportunity to go to court and, right. uh, you know, try to overturn our decision. And that does happen once in a while. But I would say probably the greater majority of all our cases are ended that night. Thank you. Well, and there will, there is, uh, like you say before, the that's uh, not on the next agenda because I'm still reviewing them, but there are a lot of changes. And again, some of those changes are proposed. We need to look at those to make sure those changes aren't, aren't coinciding with some other things in the zoning uh, boards, uh, zoning laws. So thank you for all you do. And it is, it's probably the most important board in the city, in my opinion. So thank you for all you do. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you. Councilor. And, and again, point of information, uh, what, what, Mr. what the chief said is 100% accurate. Uh, there was a convenience store on Pleasant Street that was granted uh, certain things by ZBA, and those steps attached, uh, plantings and greenery that have not happened. I've gotten calls. I know Councilor Cruz have gotten called by residents. I called Mr. Kassiri, and uh, April called me back same day, and I know she notified Mr. Cruz that they have to have those planted in March. Uh, that same establishment started doing U-Haul rentals. I called Mr. Kassiri's office and they ceased that day. Uh, I was called today by the same individual who always calls us that supposedly, and I haven't verified that, there's something else being uh, on, on the property uh, for sale, but automobiles. We have to look into that tomorrow by calling Mr. Kassiri. So don't hesitate to call Mr. Kassiri. He works great with the Absolutely. ZBA and uh, his staff is great as well. But when steps are attached, that's a legal condition precedent to what was granted by the ZBA and we need to make sure they're adhered to. Mm -hmm. Any other questions just, for the Just chief? a point of information. I, sure. I, I, I certainly don't want to leave anyone with the impression that I thought the building department wasn't doing no, its no, work. No, no, I'm not saying that. I was giving you an example of one that was yeah. it, it, inaccurate. The STIPs haven't been adhered to, No, and they I, need to be. They, they do a great job, but it all comes down to how much personnel do you have, and they're stretched thin. So I think I was leaning more towards, you know, eventually when we go through the building boom, you've got to add personnel to the building Absolutely. Department. Thank you. Consigliere, follow thank you. Up. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick follow-up, something that just um, caught my ear, and maybe you can just explain it um, probably just in a, in a couple of a couple of minutes. Um, at the end of every meeting, so you take the next day or two or three, and you have to more or less write what your cases were all about, and that goes to where? It goes to the building department to be printed. Okay. When it's done, then all the board members have to come in and read my decision. If they agree with it, they sign it. Then it goes to the petitioner. Then the petitioner has to get that recorded. It has 20 days for an appeal period through the clerk's office. So there's a whole series of steps after Okay. Okay, so that's what starts the process when we hear a lot of times as counselors that they've got the 20 days or whatever, you know. Right. But it's all based upon, that's your work as a chairperson, right? It's, that's what you're, you're controlled to do, correct? That's why nobody else wants to be the chair. <laughs> <laughs> no, truly, no, that no, is I, the decision of the chair. Okay, yes. so it is. Okay, great, great. Thank you. And, and again, I thank you for all your work and, and, and the members of that board as well for the many times I've been before it. And, you know, it is amazing when we do go before boards like like the zoning or planning as councils, a lot of times people feel, well, we need to, you know, we got to get our councils there that they think that what we say turns things around, and it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It no. doesn't. We're there because we have to represent our constituents, and we do it to the best ability to what we think is fair for them and fair for the city. But ultimately, like I say to people, that's the zoning board. They got rules and regulations. I don't make those rules and regulations, and some people don't understand that. So, but I appreciate, I appreciate all that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. The Chairman. other thing you may notice uh, on the board is a number of our decisions are five to nothing decisions. Mm -hmm. And that usually indicates that we have a board that has put serious thought into, you know, when you get three to two decisions and it can go either way, but we're a pretty consistent board. Exactly. And, and I commend you for going, like you say, and I think every board member does, you go out there. I know when I was on the planning board, I sat there for three and a half years and, 
you go out there and you take a look at what's before you, what's coming up with the next agenda. It, that's your homework to do, you know. Right. It's, it's like today we were out there looking at traffic issues. Well, traffic. So, <coughs> yeah. You're on the traffic commission doing that piece too. But, um, and some people don't realize that it is the time consumption of, of making sure you're making the decision what's in the best interest of everybody, really. So. But again, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, follow up, Council Bonds. Yes, not, not to belabor this, but just something that you said, I want to make sure I heard it correctly. So as the chair, um, the decision is yours to make with the, the contribution of the other members or? Well, if we have a case that comes before us and we take a vote and it's a five to nothing decision to approve. Right. I have to write a paragraph or two indicating why we felt that that should be approved. Okay. And I have to base that on what's in the law. Okay, so it's not your kind of final decision as the Board's chair? Board's decision. Okay. I'm the guy that writes it, but it's based upon what the vote of the board was. Okay, all right, all right. That's yep. what I wanted to make sure I heard. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Any other questions? Good question. Chief? Councilor Cruz, follow up. What's it, uh, somebody to file an application to come in, what's it cost them? I think it's $160 for a house, and it may be more for commercial. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Fowell, entertain a motion. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Motion second. made properly, second favorable recommendation back to full council. All in favor? I'll oppose that motion. Carries. Thank you, Chief. Thanks, just Chief. before I go, I just want to thank you as the council for your support for what we do on the board. And I want to uh, just say a good word for the building department the uh, planning department and the zoning board that works with me. The three of us have to work together and I think right now we got a board and a group of people that work very well. Thank, Thank you. you Chief. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good evening. Madam Clerk, we're gonna go on to agenda seven. Resolved to invite Mr. Bill Carpenter, the mayor of Brockton and not a designee to the city council to inform us as to the current status of all governing boards, commissions and committees. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter. Council Blower Guide. Yes, I filed this resolve for reasons that, as we just saw, the Zoning Board of Appeals, for example, needs all its members, and there are more, there's more than one board or commission or that is missing an individual or a couple of individuals, and that holds up the progress of this community. So I filed this, and I believe that you were notified that we will not see the mayor this evening, but I hope that we can turn around and postpone this to the next Finance Committee meeting in March March to have the mayor come up and, and give us uh, an update on where we are with um, the situation. Second. Motion made, properly seconded to postpone agenda seven until the first FinCom in March. All in favor? All opposed, motion carries. We're gonna postpone that to the first finance in March. Agenda and the last agenda item is number eight. Resolved to invite Executive Director of the Brockton Housing Authority, Thomas Tebow, to give the City Council an update on the condition <coughs> of current properties in the city with particular attention to those that have multi-purpose uses, for example, resident and office space that does not include the Housing Authority. Invited Thomas Tebow, Executive Director, Brockton Housing Authority. Council Borgen, I didn't hear from Mr. Tebow, but I believe you did today. Yes, I received a message from him uh, later this afternoon that he had just received the invitation to come this evening and of course he had prior engagement and could not make it he wishes to attend so i'd like to also postpone this to the next finance committee meeting in march second motion made probably second to postpone agenda item eight until the first fit come in march on favor i'll post motion carries we're going to postpone that until the first finance in march any other matters before us councils I council Beauregard, moment of personal privilege? Yes. Mm. Uh, you don't need okay. to stand, Council. Well, I just... Um, oh, you want to stand. Go yes, ahead. Yes, I want to stand. Ahead, yeah, council. I'm having trouble with my chair here. Someone played around with it. Actually, I say that um, our uh, Council Lally is not here this evening, um, but uh, he's involved with the program that gets uh, students involved, uh, his alumni, Cardinal Spellman and Ashley Whitman Hanson, and they were sitting in our seats, and they were supposed to be the Judiciary Committee of uh, the U.S. Senate. So it proved to be very interesting. They were addressing uh, the uh, gun laws, and uh, very you know they 
they had uh, lobbyists, and the whole reenactment of this was very interesting. They learned quite a bit, and there was a lot of energy in the room. <laughs> of course, the oldest person was probably 24, so that might have had something to do with it. But it was very exciting to realize that there was that much interest in, in, the, in the process and, of, uh, and policies of this uh, nation. But uh, what uh, I'm saying this evening is we had brought up, um, some of us, that we attend other meetings like the similar to ZBA and uh, to report back to the city council and to the public, just a little synopsis. So it's the first time I'm doing this. I attended the water commission meeting that had been postponed due to the snow from last week. It was held this morning and they covered a few things, but I'm just going to give a couple of highlights. They have a full board at this moment for the Water Commission. They also have, uh, they're fully staffed in that department, which is uh, rather positive here. There have been no major uh, breaks in water um, pipes, and that, that was rather encouraging. And they talked about various plans that have to do with the future of water in this city, and some plans also for the development of what's going on and the needs. So we're going to um, hear more from them as they were putting together uh, a letter and also filing for new policy when it comes to situations with condos and apartment complexes and the water and how that, that's managed. So uh, that's just an update and, uh, and I hope to provide people with more information in the future. It's my first time and you write some notes and you try to follow what's going on and I just feel that people have the right to know what's going on and uh, water, in this case, well, in all cases, is a huge issue. So I'm going to keep uh, everyone posted as, as the need arises. Thank, Thank you, you. Council. Any other things? Council, I just want to share a quick story with you. Uh, last Wednesday night, I went to the main Y here in the city of Brockton. And we have so many good people that work for the city of Brockton that give back. And I'll give you an example. Chris O'Reilly, who recently came before us when we promoted him for the fire department, he uh, volunteered his time that night. Um, left his wife and his family to go to the Y and teach the Cub Scout Pack 2000 water safety for two hours. And I happened to be there because uh, my son was involved, but Chris just did it. And as you know, Chris's father, the late Mark O'Reilly, was an icon in Brockton swimming circles and also chief of staff here on the May unit. So, um, you know, I'm just going to zero in on, on Chris because I witnessed that, but every day we have people that work for the city of Brockton that are making uh, differences in the lives of the youth here in the city of Brockton. So if there's nothing else before us, councils, I'm going to join and, and wish you a good evening.